Heroes should not be the only ones in the public eye. There are many unheard behind bars fighting for their own lives, many times unsuccessful. Remember the accusations are not proof enough and conviction depends upon evidence and due process of the law. No one should be wrongly despaired of their rights to liberty and freedom without just cause. Yet in 25 years alone, thousands of individuals have been wrongly convicted and sentenced to 10,000 years in prison. And now, our mission is to protect the innocent from wrongful convictions, those currently serving time for crimes they did not commit, or given a second chance for those who have overserved their time to society. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are here to fight for the innocent. Welcome to my show, Forgotten Prisoners. Let's take a moment and learn more about the background of Forgotten Prisoners TV show produced by Second Chance TV Shows and Production as Lily May of ID 104 Radio and its consulting time interviews the creator and host. Alrighty, so I'm um, very, very glad to be here this evening. So tell me a little bit about what values are important to you when you think about building, you know, this brand in the entertainment and film industry. Uh, my, for me, it will be uh, my life story. I want everybody to know what my life story was about and, and sustain uh, uh, everything that you have as for yourself as a black minority person. Basically, I'm going to keep speaking that because a lot of us ain't, ain't worthy to uh, get things done like this or worthy to join uh, with federal people to uh, help our black minority people. Uh, so uh, for to me, it's not just the entertainment, it's about lives, you know, lives, lives matter, you know, when it goes down for our black minority people or any, any minority people uh, in that aspect. But however, you know, most of us are, are black minority people and uh, for it to stand, how it stands is, you know, second chance saves lives, you know, and uh, that's what, that's what usually uh, my motto is, my MO is for where it's to need to stand at and how uh, we can uh, reflect uh, on the communities to reflect on the world today, uh, what and what not to do far as when you getting yourself involved in, in this situation and try to help uh, and, and move forward with life, you know, and, and that's my values on everything. So. Absolutely. And John, what about you? What were some of the values that um, seemingly pushed and catalyzed this uh, merger and this project? Well, I'll tell you, uh, on many levels, I, I second Paul's uh, sentiment regarding consistency and drawing upon one's life experiences. I've always been a black sheep, so to speak. So years and years ago, when I was investigating in New York City, uh, I was uh, indicting the complacency of my fellow investigators. Before I got into the federal government, I spent three years as a tenure teacher with the New York City Board of Education. And that gave me a, a fundamental dislike for educators. I consider myself an educator, but what I disliked about educators in New York City at the time was their tendency to teach these vulnerable children that they were victims and not victors. And I often thought that that was inauthentic. And I often thought that that compounded the uh, very difficult situation very difficult circumstances that, the, that these youth were wrestling with to begin with. So for example, in New York City, oftentimes a child came to school because they knew they could at least only get one meal that day, lunchtime. Or they came to school because the school had heat and, and the tenement didn't. Or they came to school because if they stayed home, they were gonna get jumped. And so oftentimes they came to school and I was known as a disciplinarian. And uh, one of the reasons why I was the black sheep is that very few students passed my class because I will not contribute to this herd mentality. Because when you're an eighth grader who can't read, you were formerly a fourth grader who couldn't read. And I used to wonder, how the heck did you get to the eighth grade? And I was teaching high school freshmen. And so I was not going to be a part of that uh, broken system. However, I had the highest attendance for all, all of my classes. Why? Because as much as the students may have viscerally disliked me in terms of my attention to detail and discipline, kids enjoy structure. And so they would come to class 
of only just to have 45 minutes of peace. And so that put me on the map in terms of the teachers union because I was falsely ac accused of grade inflation. And when I uh, asked my department chair to go ahead and run the numbers regarding our quarterly, she found, and she was a big supporter of mine, big, big supporter, uh, Mrs. Wood, she had long since retired. She just in cousin of, uh, of, uh, of Oprah. And um, that's a different story, but she uh, saw that the fundamental quality of authenticity in the classroom was what drew kids. Now, when I left education, went into federal law enforcement, I was a special agent for one of those three-letter agencies that I, I don't talk about because I'm still very active in the law enforcement community. I was very uh, quickly confronted with a high degree of uh, a great discrepancy regarding what our ideals were, what our mission statement was for federal law enforcement, and what I was seeing at the street level. So I started in the streets of Brooklyn. In time, I ended up in LA. And uh, when I left the service, I just stayed in LA. I actually was just back in New York for our our, our law enforcement. So to, to, to sum up my time in education, my time in law enforcement, my, my time uh, at the collegiate level as a director of, of criminal justice, it really shaped and informed my desire to impact people in, in a way that they weren't going to get from a, from a law book, that they weren't going to get from law enforcement, even the courts. So I ended up working with Paul quite by accident. Uh, I was supposed to be a guest speaker regarding one of the cases I've been working for about five years now. And one thing led to another, and Paul and Tiffany suggested that maybe I, I come on as the host of the show. And I jumped at the opportunity because it would, be an op it would be an opportunity for us to really impact the general public. Our goal, aside from highlighting the plight of these individual defendants, is really to use the show as a platform to teach the general public about things that they can do to secure their constitutional safeguards. Amazing, amazing. So we are looking at an entity that is seemingly hungering for justice on the entertainment and educational side of things. So it sounds like you guys are, are establishing this system on morals, security, consistency, hard work, and things of that nature. So what are your thoughts about this entity when you think about reality TV today? Because it seems like that's kind of the way it's going, but it's more documentary based. Mm. Would that be about right? Well, I can suggest, you know, I work here in, in, in L.A., so I spend a lot of time in Hollywood. So reality TV is really scripted reality. And so, you know, you know it's a different category than a true documentary. Uh, I hope I hope that somehow we don't get tagged with the term uh, reality because I don't want people to think that we're scripted. We're not. We are going to be going against the grain. We're going to be stepping on toes. The show will be calling out a, a series of levels of misconduct. So at the most immediate level, there's this police misconduct. Okay. Then there could be misconduct in terms of poor representation, uh, a common theme against uh, amongst many of the defendants that we're looking at right now is that they were poorly represented in most of those cases by the public defender's office. Don't even get me started <laughs> on, the, on the PD's office. Right. And then uh, attached to that, there could be prosecutorial misconduct where the prosecutors are either withholding exculpatory evidence and exculpatory is that evidence which would tend to prove someone's innocence. And then there could be judicial misconduct. It could be there could be a judge who rightly should be affirming a defense attorney's motion for a mistrial, but decides not to. And then another thing is we're looking at cases at the state and federal level and the show will get very detailed. We've got a legal staff. We've got former prosecutors working with us. Uh, I myself, I've got three or four FBI agents here in Los Angeles who are prepared to go out and do the groundwork in terms of witnessing interviews, finding exculpatory evidence. I'm just about, in the next couple of days, I'm about to get on the phone with the prosecutor's office back east, and I'm going to challenge the finding in terms of what I've seen in the discovery. So one of the things that families do when they when they petition to be on the show is that they got to submit the discovery material to us. And then we review the material. And when we see that there are issues that need to be addressed, then those become strong candidates for submission. And the thing is, is that we are not necessarily 
defending anyone per se. What we're doing is we're raising relevant material questions that need to be examined because you will find as the show continues that although the individual defendants have different circumstances in terms of uh, why or how they came to find themselves incarcerated, there is a theme that pervades each of the case which has a greater applicability to the common man in the street. And so there's something that we can do to highlight the plight of the defendant and at the end teach the general audience about things that they could do to secure themselves. That's really our goal. And ultimately, we want to use the, sh the goal as a platform for getting us out into the streets of America. I would like to show up in community centers in the, in the urban areas and run these three to five hour law classes for freshmen in high school, teaching freshmen what they need to do when they come into contact with law enforcement. We have a little tint to our skin, so we're not going to play the race card here. But the fact remains is that I'm very dissatisfied with the quality of the conversation in the minority community in terms of how parents are preparing their kids for interaction with law enforcement. And what they're doing is that part of the messaging is instilling so much fear in the child that when you look at cases where teenagers have gone astray when it comes to contact with law enforcement, oftentimes it's predicated by the child. When I say child, I mean, these are young men and women, they're 16, 17. They give in to panic and fear. And they instinctively do something or say something they wouldn't have done under normal circumstances. And so that's where I would like to amend the messaging when it comes to how parents are sharing with kids, how they should conduct themselves. I like to give them the law. Straight out. I want to teach them how to look at a police policy manual, how to look at the laws of the state. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it seems that this, um, you know, this platform, this initiative, and I want to call it an initiative because you are dabbing and dibbling into some things that we need and so many people are doing around the country, but not in this manner. So this is utterly amazing. Now, Paul, shifting back to you briefly, sum it up. You have one minute, you have one minute to tell the world what this is and why this is your passion. It's unjustice. It's unjustice not to me, but our minority people, uh, because when you say reality, not reality TV, but reality was going on right now with our communities, uh, the, the cricket FBI agents, the cricket uh, police officers and everybody. I was I was falsely accused once. And, uh, you know, I told the guy from Secret Service, I said, I'm going to get you one day. And he laughed at me. You know, this is 2008 when I was falsely accused of wrongly incarcerated. So for me, to sum everything up, it, it, it's just injustice. It's injustice not just on their part, it's injustice on the judge part because he can overrule stuff if he see things that's wrong, but he just want to sit in his chair and get his paycheck. You know, it's all about money now in the world today. And they they getting us, uh, as they call, legally slavery. And that's what it's all about, money, slavery. But in all reality, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, it's injustice. You know, that's what we stand for now. And I'm not backing down. This is my life. This is what happened to me. And uh, we're going to move forward with it. And we're going to try to help everybody in the world. Uh, even though we have one or two cases, we show it live on TV. A lot of people be scrambling and see if they got the case just like ours. And then they start, you know, shoveling their uh, boo-boo, you know, back in the, you know, in the barn so nobody will find it. But don't worry about it. We're going to keep going. We're going to keep moving. However, is it going to stop? Absolutely not. Because this is the United States. Can we make a difference? Absolutely. And that's what we're here today. We're going to make a difference in this world today. We're standing on what we believe in, injustice, and we heal. And that's it. We are here right now. It's our time. We here. So. Amazing. So, guys, it's definitely um, been awesome speaking with you. This platform and this program speaks to the sociology of our criminal justice system. So I'm looking for some social disorganization theory. I'm looking for Travis Hershey social bond theory. I am really ready to get hot and heavy with you guys. Thank you right. so very much. Thank you. We will see you soon. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate your time you. and interview.